Hit. So uh, yeah, welcome to Phone Banking 101 um, with DSA Austin and Austin Safer Wind Campaign. So why is it important to phone bank? Um, and from an electoral perspective, voter contact wins campaigns. And it has like at least three major functions, although like this can be varied based on your objectives and your script. Uh, but mostly you're gonna start for, you know, the rollout and identification campaign, finding out like where people are at and identifying supporters, uh, opposition and undecided folks. And then supporters, you can like quickly like put into like a mobilization regimen or an escalation lab. And we're going to talk more about that shortly. Um, but you can, you know, count them among people who can take action in support of your campaign and your objectives. And then you have an undecided list where you're going to apply like more persuasion either in that call or follow ups. And again, we're going to talk more about that soon. And that takes us to persuasion, which is like exactly what it sounds like convincing undecided people to support your campaign. There's a lot of methods to do that. And um, some of the best are uh, deep canvassing or deep conversation, um, which is usually employed at the doors, but you can, you can have variations uh, over the phone and you can't have really uh, deep and good conversations. But at the same time, uh, as we're gonna see, like phone banking has like uh, other primary purposes, like mobilization or getting out the vote, which is getting people you know already support your organization campaign or objective out to events or taking other action items. And, and in this case, like from electoral perspective, voting. Uh, 2008 study, well, you can see here, but like, yeah, a study shows that um, what's called vote planning or visualization leads to an increase in the likelihood of turning out and voting. And then also like, and this takes us into like some of the deeper stuff you can do with any form of contact, including phone banking. And that is trying to like build deeper networks around an organization objective or cause. Um, you can use phone banking and door knocking to bring people together, establish relationships and build coalitions as well as like your, uh, your capabilities. And a great example is presented here on the slide from Central Connecticut DSA, where they were able to start chapters during an electoral campaign and from the organizing like that helped gestate those chapters, even though the electoral campaign wasn't successful, they grew their organization and their organizing power and therefore their, their political power too. Um, and this is an important point that like phone banking is just one part of an engagement plan or an organizing plan and an escalation ladder. And there has to be follow-up engagement, um, usually with other contact methods like door knocking or engaging somebody in a deeper conversation at an event, maybe that you mobilize them to. So, Every, and we're, that's gonna be a recurrent theme, is that every contact method uh, does have its limitations and, uh, and they have to be deployed together and they complement each other, so. A little bit more on this, um, in terms of building neighborhood networks and uh, social coalitions, uh, you can be more personal and more persuasive, especially relative to say an email or a text, and, uh, like other mass communications, um, and reach people who don't uh, have cell phones or don't want to receive texts. Um, and we can, like phone banks like are great at, at deepening member involvement. That's like an example of mobilization. Someone that's already joined the, the organization or the campaign, and you have their contact information affirmatively because they've given it to you. Phone banking, obviously, you know, great way to mobilize them, but also to start having people in your organization or your campaign talking to each other. Uh, phone banking is something you can have volunteers and other membership do. Um, and that can lead to setting up one-on-ones, especially like if, if a campaign is over the long term, if it has like an electoral component, but an issue focus, um, or, or if you know, even if you're just like setting up neighborhood contact teams. Um, and uh, you can use it to check in with members and volunteers who, who maybe uh, you, know, you haven't seen or heard from in a while. It's again, more personal than texting and other forms that are more mass, on mass. And um, yeah, and, and you can sort of see where people are at, wh uh, what they might be interested in and then make a tailored ask um, to, to do an action item or as you can see, like take, take on leadership in a project.
So thoughts and questions so far? Anyone wanted to jump in with anything? All right. So, oh, whoops, how do I go back? There we go, sorry about that. Scale versus effectiveness, already a theme we've talked about a little bit, but uh, as you can, as you might imagine, like door knocking is uh, slow and steady compared to other forms of contact. Like, you know, clearly you can text more people in an hour, but there's, um, there's uh, some strong evidence to suggest that it's uh, the most effective way of persuading or moving voters uh, over time, getting them to like to change their mind or their viewpoint on a set of issues or candidates. Um, and then likewise, uh, you know, another problem that conversations in public have, um, you can reach more people per hour, this meaning like relative to knocking on a door and in some cases even making dials if you, if you don't have like a smart dialing system but uh, there's no targeting mechanism, right? Like the only targeting you have is like picking events that are loosely say in the district of the person you're trying to elect. Uh, whereas phone calls can be much more targeted, right? With a list, especially as I say, when you have an automated dialer. Um, and then here, we, and that brings us to phone calls can hit more people per hour, less effective than door knocking, um, typically less effective than uh, stationary canvassing at events. Although you can you can do a lot to move that, um, and and it, this kind of relationship goes for texts and social media posts and these other on mass uh, media forms, right? The more people that you're hitting at once, typically as the scale grows, the effectiveness diminishes per person, and, and so on. And that that brings us to the practical phone banking code, like so. So this refers to the, the codes that you'll enter typically in a, uh, in a smartphone banking system, or even like a, you know, some kind of like semi-analog, like spreadsheet record keeping thing. Um, more on that later. But uh, this is typically what most campaigns will use in the voter activation network or, or similar data platform. Um, always check your campaign's guide first though, because sometimes this does differ and, and they should have guidance for you from the field director or similar. Um, so what's the one to five scale? So one means a strong supporter of your campaign or organization and five is a strong opponent. So even if you're running some sort of opposition campaign where you're trying to get people to vote no, if they say they're voting no, they're still a one. If they say they're voting yes, they would still be a five. One is just a strong supporter of whatever you're doing or trying to ask people to do or join you in. And five is someone who strongly opposes it. So that means naturally a three is someone who's undecided on, on the specific thing you're surveying them on. A two is someone leaning in, in favor of your cause um, or, or even pretty in favor of it. Um, and then likewise, four is someone who's leaning against. Um, meaning they're not 100% and, and maybe maybe they're persuadable, maybe. Um, NH is not home. You made, a, you made a call and they weren't home. And uh, often that'll also be like left message. A lot of times you'll see LM there. If you're leaving a voicemail, that'll also be scripted in most phone banks. So LM and NH are kind of similar. Sometimes their voicemail is full. Busy is what it sounds like when you get a busy signal when your phone banking moved is when the uh, person, I mean, this is usually for door knocking, but when the person is moved away from the address. And sometimes I suppose with landlines, it, you know, maybe that might be the case that you get a move response. But also if you're trying to talk to a specific person, it might be that the person who picks up says like that person moved, you know? So anyway, wrong number, right? Is what it sounds like, refused. Um, if you get someone who refuses to hear your message. So that's a little different than a five. A five means they did hear your message um, and in your cause and, and you can code them as an opponent. But a refused means they didn't really get the payload. They didn't get the message. And that's a little bit different than a five. So, and then do not call means they made an explicit um, ask of you that, that you not call them again, specifically do not call them again and like, uh, maybe put them on a do not call list as an analog. Um, oh, what, what did I do? Hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, 
this you always want to track how many calls you make um and pretty much every other like point of data that the platform or the script is asking you to record so that might be recording people on a one to five scale um and it might be like marking down volunteers or asking other like issue-based survey questions depending on the campaign um like as it says here using the data platform and the campaign and your org will probably be setting goals and um, that helps you know like you know relative to the contest and how many votes you need how effective you're being hopefully so what are some fun tips uh for calling and probably at the uh you know we'll ask for some folks to to chip in some of their tips from their experience as we move through these but uh you don't want to spend too much time on any one person um any one voter uh there's always exceptions to every rule if things are going really well um if they're really interested in your organization or other opportunities or if they have some kind of like pertinent information or opportunity to talk to your campaign about i mean in general though you shouldn't really spend more than eight to ten minutes and most of your calls are going to be three to five minutes if you're like if you're pretty lucky um and that's so that you're hitting like enough people to be effective every shift that you're phone banking. Um, you uh, you always want to try to confirm the name or of like the the target of the person you're speaking to to make sure that your data has good like integrity that you're recording the result for the person that the campaign is trying to contact. Primarily because that's going to inform their follow up strategy if they follow up with that person what and what they say and what they ask ask of them. Um, and like similarly, you want to try to get feedback if the caller is unsure and, uh, you know, ask them why and, and maybe have a deeper conversation with them. And that's to get good data and, and also like, you know, to have a real an effective and persuasive conversation with someone. Um, likewise, always complete your script and ask all the questions possible and dually, re you know, record uh, every response you get, even if it's a no. Um, because that's like the best data your campaign can have in terms of, again, crafting their follow-up strategy. Um, yeah, so don't just, um, a lot, you know, a lot of times it is tempting to, yeah, to get excited and just move on, but try to maximize every conversation you have um, and, and, you know, make a, a good relationship every time. Um, Anna, did, uh, did you want to jump in on some of these? Sorry if I'm like talking a lot. No, you're doing great. Go ahead. All right. So also talking about uh, calling tips, smile while you dial. Uh, it's a bit of a metaphor and maybe a little dated, but it just means you want to be happy while you're calling and kind of have a positive attitude. And it just helps you be effective every time you call. And there's like, oh, there's some good data behind it. But yeah, um, even just the act of smiling can um, improve like your mood and, and then your effectiveness. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, but yeah, I mean, so not only do you not want to spend too much time on any one call and you want to be cognizant of that in general, like if someone is being really, really negative, uh, just move on. Um, like there's always another number. Uh, that's, that's a saying, there's always another door. There's always another number. I mean, there's always someone else you can be talking to. Um, and it's unlikely if someone's like deeply negative that you're going to like move them to be honest. So, um, you want to use first person case and have a personal reason why you're invested in the campaign. So like I, I statements are good and you know, it's, it's okay to be, to, to be personal in like, uh, in like when you're motivating them and, and talking about why you're doing the work you're doing. Um, yeah, but, and, and also make sure you're like representing the organization and all that, but it, it is actually really important and effective to, uh, to form a connection with the other person. Um, you, if you don't know the answer, especially to a question they're asking, or, or you just, you know, you don't know something, it's okay to say that. And if the script doesn't have it, say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, I'm going to go find out and ask uh, the volunteer coordinator, the field director, or the other um, kind of coordinating person on the campaign that you're volunteering for or working for. And uh, yeah, because you don't want to, you don't want to step out on a limb and, and say something maybe uh, you don't mean or don't know if it's true. And it's okay not to know. People respect that. Um, and this is related. You want to stick to the script at first and don't improvise until you know it. So you're probably thinking, well, how do I put myself into the script and in the campaign if I'm not allowed to improvise? 
well, do a, do a few calls by the script first. And once you get the hang of it, um, you know, feel like you've got your sea legs, so to speak, then you can really start to like improvise and, and tell stories about yourself and how you connect to the issues at stake in the election or, or other political contests you're talking about. Um, oh, welcome. Got some more folks joining us. Maybe we, uh, if more people have joined since we started, maybe we'll take a break after this one for more intros, but y'all can let me know in the chat what you think of that. In any case, uh, we're talking about a uh, phone banking, electoral organizing lens, and we're just doing some basic call tips right now. When you're mobilizing, you wanna, uh, we talked about this a little before, nudge folks to uh, visualize uh, what they're doing and also ask them to take a friend to the polls or the, uh, of the event or other action item. Uh, that gets more people to do it. Visualizing um, when you're talking to someone on the phone means like what day and what time are you going to vote? Like which event can we count you at Saturday at 2 p.m.? You know, like that. Um, there's like studies that show that when people do that and when they make a plan, they're more likely to follow through and deliver the action item. Moving right along. Here's some advanced calling tips, and we're gonna focus on active listening. But before we do, did anyone wanna jump in with any tips or tricks they might have from their phone banking experience? Um, I guess I have one. Oh, um, sure. Sometimes I feel like people will say they're busy and like they can't talk to you. Um, and you know, it's good not to be pushy, but um, I, I just keep on going with the script usually, um, just because, you know, you're really not talking to them for that long and they already answered the phone. Um, so, you know, they'll stop you if they really wanna hang up and then you can just offer to like follow up with a text, but um, but yeah, sometimes people are like, oh, I'm actually in the middle of something, um, but they already answered the phone. So I think, um, yeah, at least trying to keep going with your script is not always a bad idea. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that's great. Um, any, anyone else have some thoughts? Oh, uh, in the chat we have, uh, it can be helpful to have local uh, help numbers on hand in case someone asks, like the COVID hotline or your support. And that's really an, an, an awesome point because the issues you're talking about at stake in an election often have like, you know, immediate impact on folks' lives. And so they're gonna want, or they're going to like consider like some sort of like immediate support for something they're going through and not just like the mediated solution of an election. Sometimes your uh, your organization will have programming that's directly relevant. So that's a, that's a really good point. I love that. Okay. Well, um, thank thanks y'all for uh, for sharing for jumping in there. Um, some more uh, tips for phone banking. Um, make people feel heard and uh, and validate them when when you're talking to them. Um, and we're gonna go over some uh, some like met method there, some like you know kind of like thought exercises for that. And uh, you know, uh, say when you have things in common with them, or like how they're feeling, or situations they've experienced. That's like a great way to form a connection and let them know that you're uh, listening, that you're like deeply listening, right? Um, asking how rather than why. Uh, this is a, a kind of an interesting one, and what, what organizers mean by that is like that why can be like a, a difficult, like, you know, sort of thing to parse, but like how is like, you know, steps we could take to move forward, or like, you know, how something got to, to where things are, because that starts a similar conversation of what are steps we could take um, to address what's going on. But like, obviously, like, you know, people might want to talk about why too, and, and uh, you definitely want to, as we talked about, Make sure you know people know you're listening to them. Oh, in the chat. Um, yeah, it can help. It can definitely help to let folks know that you uh, that you live in the community, and um, because they expect like non-regional or like non-local callers, and like that you share like that level of community of interest. So that's a great. That's also a great point uh, from Haley in the chat. Awesome. Um, yeah, and uh, bridge back into the topic that you wanted to talk to them about. 
And this, this is something we talked about in the first OTS about the tension between like the objective you have and making sure that your program or your org is responsive to needs in the community. But um, especially when it comes to electoral organizing, when you have a discrete objective and like a key action item in voting, you wanna try to bridge back to the topic and, and the core action item of like how what you're talking about will be addressed by perhaps the candidate's platform or your organization's program and why the action item is so important. And that brings us to um, the active listening method exercise of ORs, which is, as you can see, open-ended questions, affirmation, re reflective listening, and summation. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So yeah, open-ended questions. Um, these establish a safe environment. Um, they help us explore and clarify and gain understanding and therefore connection. And uh, we learn about the person, their experiences and so on, as you can see, right? feelings and beliefs and like experiences with the issues we might be talking about. Um, do you all wanna maybe like do, uh, give some examples of, of good open-ended questions you've had like result with in the field, if you have? It's cool, we, we, we'll just keep moving. So affirmation. Um, is uh yeah like affirming what they're saying right uh, it builds rapport and you uh shows empathy and uh and and what they're talking to them about and and so on like and there's some good examples here of like uh affirmation and uh the probably the biggest one is your right to feel that way we're like that's that's justified these are things we can do about it in the chat let's see Yeah, as Ashley says in the chat, it's always good to ask them how they feel about um, a situation um, or like an issue, definitely. Hmm, there we go. Reflective dialogue or reflective listening. Uh, listen closely when you're speaking with someone um, that, that builds understanding and connection. Um, listen, observe, share, and reflect on your own possessions of what they share. So that shows that you're listening. And these are good examples on the slide. Um, some of what I heard you say, um, you just really said that it's important for you and you seem or you're, you're, you, I, it seems like you're feeling are good ways you know, to, to do reflective listening and give them, a, you know, showing that you're listening, but then also giving them a chance to get feedback to make sure you understand, right? Prevents misunderstanding is another way of saying it. And that brings us to summation. Um, we want to move the conversation forward, uh, keeping like to like the framework of the action item or the campaign, um, including like asking our survey questions, like our ID questions and our action item questions. Um, and you know, again, you're checking back to make sure that you're understanding the person and you're understood um, in terms of goals, preferences, and like again, like beliefs, level of support, etc. How would you summarize, like how you feel about this? Like, what do you think? Um, are you ready to take action? These are all examples. Let's make a plan. Yeah. Setting expectations. Manual dialers uh, will mean that you'll dial more slowly and your response rate will be lower. Um, but, every call counts. And like, as you can see, like Bernie won his first mayoral election, I guess by 10 votes. I didn't know that um, until I saw the slideshow. An auto dialer will reach more people, but it's a sh short pause before you're connected. There can be other technical glitches. So an auto dialer, and there's, there's variations of course, but it calls multiple people at the same time using a digital or a digital platform and then serves the answered calls to the to the number of callers or agents um, or organizers on the system, and some of them can even leave automated voicemails, which can be uh, which can add to like your effectiveness. And uh, Jake Jake's confirming in the chat that yes, the Brian man won his first election by ten votes. It's awesome. All right, yeah. Um, every angry antagonistic voter is one that future callers or door knockers don't have to talk to. I love this tip because. It's like you can't you if you if people are picking up the phone 
and in some cases, even if they're not, you can't fail to be successful when you engage in an organized voter contact or organizing program, because you're, you're generating good data for the organization, the campaign, or the cause. And that, like we talked about, improves their follow-up uh, regimen, your general organizing program, you know, your continued engagement with these contacts. So every time you get someone who's a troll or not a supporter or an opponent, just know that you're making it easier and you're like, uh, you're making it more efficient, the entire organizing program going forward. Um, sim similar kind of uh, similar kind of spirit here is like mistakes happen. And uh, if you're making a lot of calls or you know, a lot of door knocks or however contact method you're making, um, your mistakes are lessened by the law of large numbers. And, uh, you know, with real time contact methods, you can often like fix your mistakes by having a good conversation with the person and uh, explaining and apologizing. So uh, don't worry about mistakes too much. Don't let it get you down or hurt your confidence. Just keep going. There's always another number, like we say. And this is this is a good one because people often like, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, talk about contact methods relative to each other and their limitations. So how can we build on phone banks with their with their pros and cons for like a long term organizing program or set of goals? Um, you want to write scripts to bring people into your campaign with specific issues and uh, ask action items that go beyond just voting, coming to uh, an event, coming to an organizational meeting, um, coming to like some sort of committee or action meeting that might be pertinent to the interests they've expressed, right? All of these things, um, or, or even like uh, easier things like signing a petition or making a call, right? All of this up an escalation ladder gets people more involved over the long term. And so how can we follow up with people who said they were voting or supporting your campaign to bring them into the campaign? So what are some what are some follow up methods in the chat or over voice? What do you guys think? Well, you could like go knock on their door, you could text them, you could call them again, you could email them, you could do a lot of things. Maybe if they attend an event that you invited them to, you chat them up there, you talk to them. Um, really so sophisticated organizing groups uh, will have scripts uh, even for that, you know, and campaigns that are doing stationary canvassing will too. Um, so yeah, those are, those are a lot of the methods you can use. Um, how can we build good relationships with campaign coalition partners? Well, having like, you know, good communications and uh, making sure that when we're taking like actions, the other party knows what we're doing and why we're doing it. Hopefully they're in solidarity, but if they're not, they'll appreciate the heads up. And um, yeah, mostly just uh, operating in tandem and letting the other party know what you're doing and why. Strategic planning and carrying through on uh, action items and assignments. So how can we learn from conversations to improve our practices? And well, there's, that's a good answer. Power map our communities. Um, so when when you're like phone banking and recording data, um, that's going into producing like a picture of a community or a geographic area or a base um, in a given district for your organization, or maybe even a city or a county. Uh, where are certain issues like most felt strongly about? Where are your supporters? And therefore, like where could you start mobilizing for victories, either, you know, electoral with electing people in a given district who, who are socialists or like, you know, hopefully share our, all or most of our program. I mean, socialists, let's just be clear, right? And uh, how can we, um, you know, how could we also get those uh, people to do more community organizing or take action through community organizing on those issues, right? Um, that's what, like, power mapping um, also has, a kind of a, another connotation, which is like understanding the levers and decision makers in your community or on a given set of issues. So a power map, like, I mean, one connotation of it would be your base, like how everyone in a given area feels about your organization, your cause or your set of issues. But it would, it could, it would also encompass, or part of that spreadsheet would also be like all of the decision makers on those issues from perhaps like the uh, the elected officials and the elect and the government entities to um, you know maybe even the biggest businesses or other political groups. So power mapping like uh, is often applied in a labor organizing context, 
And in that context, it'll mean like mapping out all the executives or the board or, um, uh, you know, the other power players or decision makers in your labor organizing campaign. In electoral organizing, it means like mapping out the entities, the government entities and elected officials that will move your campaign forward or take the action that you seek or make the policy change you're advocating for happen, right? And sometimes with the way our system works, that will be key because different layers of government will interact with each other and may be able to overrule each other the way that the courts can sometimes overrule laws or the way that the federal government can overrule the states, right? So yeah, that's why it's important in both contexts. 